Amen. Thank you, Brother Paul. First Peter chapter 2. So as we continue this series on the priesthood of the believer, this is a uh, very fundamental Christian doctrine. It's not, very, it's not preached very often, but I think it's very important. Um, and as we look here in First Peter chapter 2, we're going to uh, finish up on a few of these terms, these phrases that we haven't preached on yet. Uh, but let's just take a look at verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would uh, open up the Scriptures right now. Lord, we're trusting you to provide the wisdom that we need to understand. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to understand, lead us and guide us and teach us what this means. Lord, teach us how to be a righteous priest as we follow in your footsteps, our, our great high priest. Lord, teach us how to live as kings, not now, but as servants now, and as kings when we get to heaven. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're kings and priests unto Christ. One day we're going to follow in His footsteps in all aspects right now. We are following in His earthly ministry. Servant, lowly, humble, right? Those are the actions that Jesus Christ took. And as we see these verses, if you remember two weeks ago, we looked primarily at verse number 5. 1 Peter 2, verse 5, he says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. There is a holy priesthood, a spiritual priesthood. Christians are that spiritual priesthood. This is so important. This is so fundamental. The Catholic priesthood is illegitimate. Yes. The Mormon priesthood is illegitimate. It's not scriptural. Yeah. The Jewish priesthood is not biblical either. Well, now, wait a minute. Don't talk about that. Hold on. This is important, and this is what we're going to talk about today. This is so important because Christians will agree. You say, well, the priesthood of the Catholic Church, clearly in error according to Scripture. Amen. And you say, and if the Jews start a sacrifice in Israel today, and then it kind of changes the attitude, doesn't it? It's important for us to understand how to defend this doctrine because uh, as Christians that believe that Zionism is a, a tactic of the devil, you're going to be attacked by fellow Christians who will tell you, well, you have to believe that the Jews are God's chosen people. Well, that's heresy. That's not what the Bible teaches. You don't take that doctrine and force it on people. Christians are this spiritual holy priesthood. Christ as the head. He is our, our high priest. That's who we're following. Verse number 9, look what he says. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. Ye. Who's he talking to? Who is the spiritual nation that he's referring to as God's chosen? Let me break it to you. It's not the USA. The USA is not the Christian holy nation that we wish that it was. I do wish that America was Christian in their faith. They followed the Bible. I wish it was more Christian than it is. Yeah. But that's not God's chosen nation. His chosen nation is invisible. It doesn't have borders like that. It's believers. Look what he's saying here. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. It's not Israel, and it's not America. It's believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. And many people have an issue with that, but this is plainly what the Bible teaches. In fact, the next verse, look at the next verse. He says it yet again. Two witnesses. Verse 10. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Ye are chosen. Ye are the nation. Ye are the people of God. Listen, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have trusted on Him for salvation, you are this holy nation, you are the people of God. And yet, you can ask 9 out of 10 people on the street, you're going to get the wrong answer, aren't you? Oh, you mean Israel? You ask Google. You ask, you ask YouTube. What are you going to get? The wrong answer. That's not by accident. That's by design. Okay? There is a conspiracy to cover up who the true Israel is, who the people of God are. 
What's he saying in verse 11? Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Now listen, we are kings and priests. And you think about how that contrasts to strangers and pilgrims. We're just passing through. We don't belong on this earth. This is not the end for us. We're just strangers here. We're like foreigners. We're just passing through. Nothing is permanent here. The priesthood of the Christian believer we're talking about God's chosen people, this holy nation, which is Christianity. And listen, there is only one way to heaven, period. There is no other way. There is no other God. There is only one God. There's only one gospel. You cannot change the gospel and still get to heaven. There's only one church. There's only one priesthood. There's only one holy nation. And there are people that try to mix this up and say, well, there must be two. It's important to understand. You think when somebody says, "Well, those are in Israel. That's God's chosen people." And you say, well, "What about Christians?" Well, yeah, that too. Is there another way to get saved without Jesus? Mm -hmm. Is there? Is there another way to receive the promises of everlasting life? Is there another testament that actually saves your soul? I don't think so. According to the Bible, there's only one. And you know, and no Old Testament law or covenant can undo or cancel out what Jesus has already done. Jesus has fulfilled a, a great majority of the prophecy. The Lord Jesus Christ has set the captives free. He has died for the sins of the whole world. And there is no Old Testament law or covenant that changes that fact. However, you clearly have a New Testament. There is a new covenant with believers. And that has undone, or really it has fulfilled all of those prophecies from the Old Testament, the prophecies were of the Messiah. There's only one covenant that saves your soul, and it's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today there are a lot of people that are confused on this because they've been taught bad doctrine for many years. And they want to somehow reconcile this and say, well, Christians are God's people, and we have to fight for this political nation that calls itself Israel. And it's important that as Christians, we're able to defend biblically what we believe. And according to the Bible, there's only one holy nation. There is only one priesthood that God recognizes. And it's those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only that one covenant. In Hebrews 8, he says, And he saith, A new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. He's saying that first covenant, that old covenant, is now considered old because there is a new. And now that there is a new, you cannot get saved by that Old Testament, by that old covenant. And it's important to understand this. This also goes along with the priesthood and Israel. In Hebrews 10, he says, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So it isn't there's one or two, pick whichever one you want. No, he took away the first completely. It is no longer available. There is only the new covenant available for salvation. Hebrews 10, he also says, By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Because he laid his flesh down, because he died for our sins, he has given us a new and a living way. That old covenant has passed away. And again, it's not about sacrifices of animals. It's about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how we're saved, and once we're saved, we're saved forever. So again, what's it say? Verse 9. But ye, who's that? Us. Christians. Us. Yeah. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. And that's the part where you begin to lose a lot of Christian brothers and sisters. Well, now wait, you can't say that Christians are the holy nation. That's Israel. Or worse than that, you have those that actually believe that it's Rome, which is wicked. Mm. Verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. <laughs> I don't know how much clearer you could get. I mean, the case is very plainly stated here in 1 Peter. We are now the people of God. And it's very important. We have to decide. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Is it your tradition or is it your Bible? Do you want to believe what you were taught in church or in Bible school? Or do you want to believe what the Bible actually says? Do you believe that Christians are that holy nation? Or do you believe that it's political Israel? If your tradition is wrong, are you willing to fix it to get right with God? And that's the question you need to ask somebody that's hung up on the political nation. Don't you want the truth? Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. 
a very easy question you can ask somebody to find out where they stand on this spiritual doctrine is ask them a political question. Here's the question. Do you believe that the modern day state of Israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Do you believe that the modern day state of Israel is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Because the majority of those that believe in a Zionistic dispensationalism, they will teach, yes, they are back in their land. This is the blessing of God. Their doors are opening. Things are happening. You know, this is the sign that we can be raptured at any moment. Which, again, you don't see in the Bible either. But they point. They say, well, see, the Jews are in the land. Therefore, we know that the time is nigh. Now, it's interesting. I do believe to a certain extent, seeing Israel come together and have Jerusalem as its head, it's pointing toward the Antichrist. So in that regard, yeah, I think things are getting closer and closer, right? So much the more, as you see the day approaching, we can see that things are lining up for a one world government with ten regions and then one man leading it all. We see the political and the spiritual all coming together. And it's going to happen in Jerusalem. That is where the Antichrist will rule from. But most Christians would say, well, yeah, modern day, Israel, that state called Israel over there, was a promise from the Old Testament that now has come true. Well, that's simply not correct, according to the Bible. Most of the prophecies that they would want to take you to are actually prophecies about the Lord Himself coming to save His people. And listen, you have to understand that Zionism allows for a political Israel to search for a political king. And it's through, that will be uh, their, their war cry, their rallying cry, as they gather together in line for the Antichrist. All of these prophecies are really about Jesus coming as Savior. And you can't have both. You really, you should not, as a Christian, you might be an error in doctrine, thinking, well, yeah, there's the nation of Israel, plus Jesus. It doesn't work that way. The truth is, it's one or the other. Genesis chapter 12, the famous verse, what if that verse where it says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse at thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What if that is simply talking about Jesus? It's important for a Christian to understand that. Most get hung up on that, but it is just Jesus. That's the fact. You're in Galatians chapter 3. Look at this. Look at verse number 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now that's salvation. That's spiritual salvation. The forgiveness of sins, eternal life. He was saved before the cross for his faith. Verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. You understand? If you're a Christian, you're a child of Abraham. You're the children of Abraham. Part of that promise. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Galatians 3 is literally telling you, the gospel was preached, and here's how it sounded when they said, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That blessing wasn't just of a physical land. It wasn't of a of a physical nation. It's a spiritual nation. It's a holy people. It's peculiar. It's the royal priesthood that we're reading about. I mean, to me, it sounds like we're talking about the promise from God for salvation, for deliverance eternally, right? It's all spiritual. What he's saying here is very spiritual. Verse number 11, look at this. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And this is important because today there are people that still believe and teach that, well, in the Old Testament they were saved by their good works. They kept these sacrifices and the ordinance and they shed the blood of bulls and goats for their spiritual salvation. That is not true. That is heresy. To take away salvation from what Jesus has done. And I mean, God has has fulfilled all of his promises through Jesus Christ. And now he's given to us the priesthood of the believers. When you become a born-again Christian, there comes some very big responsibilities with it. You are now a holy nation. You are now a priest and a king unto Christ. We're to serve him while we're here. And when it says in verse 11 that no one's justified by the law, 
anybody that teaches anything else is preaching a false gospel. Anyone that says that you can work your way to heaven before the cross or after the resurrection, they are literally preaching a false gospel. Heresy. They're taking away from the power of the resurrection of Christ. They're taking away from the power of the gospel. You say, wait, this sounds like replacement theology, and that's kind of a, a term that people use, and I don't necessarily have a major problem with it, although there is sort of a straw man philosophy attached with it. When a Baptist hears uh, replacement theology, they see the Catholic Church and how they have their own priesthood. And that's simply not right. That's wrong. Their priesthood is illegitimate. They're not saved. It's the wrong priesthood. Jesus fulfilled these things so that He could be that promise of a blessing to all nations. You could call it fulfillment theology. I believe that Jesus has fulfilled these things. Hey, you could call it addition prophecy. You could say Jesus has added the Gentiles as well. The fact of the matter is it's been believers throughout all time are God's people. Now, it's a very simple. Understand that. If you have believed, then you're saved. And the saved are God's people. That's what the Bible teaches. And those that teach the Old Testament laws could save, they're still under a curse. They're teaching heresy. Look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You know, we preached about the Holy Spirit this morning. You get it when you believe. You keep it forever, it says in John chapter 14. And that blessing comes to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Gen and again, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Look at verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. You need to know this verse, because when somebody says, well, they were saved by the law back then, or they will be saved if they miss the rapture. That's what the Ruckmanites like to preach, you know. I have one of their tracts, and they literally say, if you miss the rapture, then you need to start working your way to heaven. Listen, that is heresy. That is strange heresy to put that, that uh, seed of doubt in someone's mind that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is not enough to save your soul. You're putting that burden on the individual. So in verse 21, if there could have been a law, if there had been a law given that could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. Verily, we would have been saved by keeping the laws, but that is impossible. He says in the next verse, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now the promises of Abraham are given to everyone that believes. It's simply by faith. And once you believe, now you are a king, a priest. You are in a spiritual priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. You are part of a holy nation. We are God's chosen people because we have chosen the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're all saved by that same promise of faith in Jesus. You know, when you think about it, the people like to chop up the Bible into different time periods and try to teach, well, before the flood, they were saved this way. And listen, before the flood, they were saved by faith that God would send His Son, the Lamb of God. They didn't do a sacrifice trusting that Lamb. If they did, they were trusting their own works. They were trusting the law. And guess what? That law did not provide righteousness. You know, those that were saved uh, before the ministry of Jesus, those that were saved during the ministry of Jesus, those saved during the ministry of Paul, they were all saved by the same way, and it's by faith alone. In Acts, you know, a lot of people point to Acts and say, well, that's a transitional book and different things are happening, and that is very true, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the early church, whether you walked with Jesus or it was a hundred years later, you're still saved by faith alone. And once you're saved, you're in that nation. When we go out soul winning today, and we knock on somebody's door, and we set the captives free, we, we teach them that Jesus has paid for all of their sins, when they believe that, they also become part of that nation. Verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, 
There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, does it say that the Jew is saved one way, the Greek another? No. Nope. We're all one. We are all children by faith, he says in verse 26, in Jesus Christ. Verse 29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. And that is the statement that the Hebrew Roots movement looks for, the dispensationalists look for, the Mormons look for, which we were talking about this earlier. You know, historically speaking, you had Darbyism. The, the, the brethren, the Plymouth brethren, they started following Darby, and Darby caused a lot of strife and contention among uh, everybody. I mean, he was a problem person. But Darby's doctrine so plagued so many different camps that people just walked away from religion. But his doctrine ended up coming to, you have the, the Campbellites in America, the Millerites, which the Millerites, when they split, you have the Seventh-day Adventist movement that came out of the William Miller movement. You have the Jehovah's Witnesses, which came out of it. You have the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith. The Mormons came from this same doctrine. And what's interesting, the Mormons back then and today teach a Zionistic dispensationalism. And they're about 30 or 40 years ahead of the Schofield Reference Bible. It was the Schofield Reference Bible that really popularized in America and made it more of common. They were passing out these Bibles everywhere. They were beginning to teach it everywhere. And Schofield himself was literally teaching a Mormon doctrine. They have the same root, the same root of error. It goes back to the same problem. They're preaching another Jesus, another Savior. And for anybody to preach somehow that Israel will come back and have another Savior. In the middle 1800s, many people recognized that as the heresy that it is. They said, no, you're rejecting Christ. Mm -hmm. And yet today, open up the phone book, pick any Baptist church, and ask them, do you believe that the common day, nation of Israel, the state of Israel, do you believe that's a fulfillment of prophecy? And when they say yes, you say, tell me what verse I should look at to see that. And you know what you're going to find? is a promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when somebody tells you this, you need because people say, oh, you don't believe that Israel is God's chosen people. You say, no, I don't. Amen. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made us God's chosen people. Yes. He has made us that holy nation. I am part of a royal priesthood. I'm just following in the footsteps of Christ. And we're not, I'm not trying to elevate myself. I'm trying to give God all the glory. But when somebody says there's a political nation that's equally important, to your Savior, you should take offense. You should be able to go to the Scriptures, namely 1 Peter chapter 2 here, and then also Galatians chapter 3. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Flip ahead to Galatians chapter number 6. And people take offense. Well, you can't say the church has replaced Israel. It's not what I'm saying. Even the New Testament tells us there was a church in the wilderness. David was in the church. Church means congregation. Listen, true believers, the true Israel is believers of all times and of all tribes and of all languages and nations. True believers, the, the church of the firstborn, as one day will be reunited in the resurrection. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now, this is what, what, what's he saying? What matters? If you kept the law of circumcision, it doesn't matter. What matters is if you are a new creature. Are you in Jesus Christ? He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So when you're in Christ, you become a new creature. Verse 16, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. If you're in Christ, here he's saying you are in the Israel of God. If you're a new creature, you're saved. If you're saved, you are that Israel of God that was promised. Go to Genesis chapter 32. We're almost done here. Stay with me. Genesis chapter number 32. Famously in Romans chapter 9, it says, Not as the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. They're not all Israel, which are of Israel. Oh, wait, there's two different Israels? Yeah, what if he said, they are not all in Christ, 
that are in the land. Or even if he said, they are not all saved that are in the Jewish religion. Because back then, the Jews that were looking for Christ, well, they got saved. They became a Christian. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They received the Holy Spirit of promise. The rule that he said here, those that walk according to this rule, well, if you're a new creature, if you're in Christ, then you are the Israel of God. Jesus puts you in Israel once you're saved. That's really another term for Christianity, but it's not used because obviously it creates confusion. That was understood for thousands of years, but now that's kind of fallen away by the wayside because the powers that be have created another Israel. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, Christians, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. You cannot say there are two groups called the people of God. The people of God are believers in God from all times, all peoples, all languages, all tribes. In Genesis 32, we're going to see the introduction of this word Israel, where it first came from. Look at verse number 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. And he wrestled with him, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Listen, that's the way we ought to be as Christians. Willing to wrestle for a blessing. Are you willing to fight for the blessing of God on your life? He said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Now we have the definition right here. What does Israel mean? Well, it means you're a prince. You are a prince, right? Uh, he says, having power with God and with man. He says, and he has prevailed. He has the victory. And the blessing here is from God. This is success in getting the blessing. And listen, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Is He not? In fact, Matthew 28, Jesus says that all power has been given Him in heaven and earth. Well, right here, what's He say? As a prince, thou hast power with God and with man, and hast prevailed. This blessing that this angel is giving to Him is directly from God. I think this angel knew what his next question was going to be, and that's why he blessed him this way. Look at it again. He gave him, I think, a blessing from his own name. Look at verse 28. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask me after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. He's wrestling with Jesus. He wants the blessing from Jesus. I mean, and I think this is a picture of salvation, and he blesses him right there. He gives him a new name. He calls him by Israel. I think Israel here is another name, if you will, for Jesus. You say, well, what was Jesus' name before Bethlehem? Well, there's several we could point to. But here I think what's being pointed to is that that name is Israel. I think Israel is the Son of God. I think it's another name for the Son of God. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Famously, in, Isaiah, in uh, 2 Chronicles 7, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now when he starts out, If my people, which are called by my name, that applies to Christians. We are called by the name of Christ, are we not? But you think about back then when this was spoken. In fact, in the very chapter, he addresses it to Israel. And then he says, My people called by my name. So when God was face to face with Jacob, God gave him his name for his faith. He called him by Israel. And then later we're told that that is, we're called by his name. Exodus 4, it says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go. That was the message when he went, Let my, my firstborn go. Israel is my son. You're in Deuteronomy 28. 
Look at verse number 9. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. You know, that applies to us as Christians, but when they were called as Israel, they were called by the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? Well, another name is Israel. Now, you think about it. When, when Christians today... Turn to, uh, turn to Ephesians chapter four, 3. We're almost done. Two more places and we'll be done here. But you think about it today. We are called by Christ's name. In the end times, we will see a false Christ arise. And when someone stands up now, and says, I am the Savior, the Messiah, we would call that blasphemy, wouldn't he? Yeah. We'd say, that is blasphemy. You can't take the name of God. When a man on earth says, I am God, you say, hey, that's blasphemy. That's worthy of punishment from God. That's not right. You think about it. And, and God's comparing that with Israel, that they were called by the name of Israel. And he said, they were a holy people. My people, which are called by my name. Well, that one of those names was Israel. And I think when God looks down and he sees a nation full of people without faith, of a mixed bloodline, they're not the children of Abraham in the flesh or by faith, and they take the name Israel and put it on themselves, I think that's blasphemy. And Christians are supporting that unknowingly. They've been lied to about history. They've been deceived by dispensational doctrine. And now they support calling a nation by the name of Jesus. Calling that nation by a name of God. Ephesians chapter 3, where you're at, look at verse number 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. Whether you're alive on the earth or whether passed on in heaven, we're all called by God's name. Now go to Revelation chapter 2. The whole family in heaven and earth is named after the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has had many names and different titles. We talked about this a week or two ago. There's like a dozen titles just in John chapter 1 alone. And yet, I think we're, see, we're seeing here that Israel is a name for God. Christian, Christ is a name for God. And it's the same pattern. People have a problem with re replacement theology and say, well, you can't say Christians have replaced Israel. Well, Israel was called after God's name. Christians are called after God's name. You see? It's the same pattern. And really, the only true people of God are those that have believed doesn't matter what time, what country, what language. If you have believed, you are the people of God. In Revelation chapter 2, look at verse number 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. This statement, blasphemy, I mean, this is a strong statement. It's blasphemous to take the name of God and give it to yourself or to somebody else. And that's what he's saying. When, when in the Old Testament, they said they were Christian, but they were really sons of the devil, or, or not Christian, but anytime anybody takes the name of God, but they're a son of the devil, that in itself is blasphemy. Yeah. You know, And that's what happens throughout history is you have people that hijack movements. If you can't beat them, join them, right? So what did the Catholic Church do? Well, just by an edict, they made everybody Christian. They signed a law, they baptized an army, and they said, hey, we're all Christians now. We'll start the universal church. We're all universally this holy nation that was spoken about. But that's not what the Bible teaches, is it? They took their pagan priests and they made them supposedly royal priests of God. That's blasphemy. When God looks at the Catholic Church, it is literally blasphemy. The things they do when they use the name God and Jesus... God calls that blasphemy. And in the same way, with Israel and the Jews, it's the same story. The blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. Anybody that would claim to be God's chosen people that has not choose the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that in itself is pure blasphemy. And I want you to remember these things because people will, I mean, for the rest of your life on earth, other Christians will probably trouble you because you may not support Israel. 
But listen, supporting Israel is doing one thing. It's establishing the throne of the Antichrist. It's blasphemy. In James 2, he says, Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? Isn't that what the world does? They blaspheme Jesus. And what are they going to do in the end times? A man will stand up in Israel. To call that Israel is blasphemy. He'll be in a religion called of the Jews or Judaism. Well, that in itself is also blasphemy. And he will stand up and take the name of God for himself. He will claim to be the Christ, and that also will be blasphemy. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Christians are the people of God. We are the holy nation. To teach anything else literally is blasphemy. Let's pray.